Again, thank you everyone for joining us to our breakfast at Abuna. Today, I would like to thank Dr. Mahal Karam. Dr. Mahal Karam is a psychiatrist in Houston, Texas, and also affiliated with the University of Texas and the Anderson Cancer Center. He has been in practice. He has been in practice for more than 20 years and his specialty is mental health, diagnose and treat mental illness, such as depression, anxiety disorder, substance abuse, and schizophrenia. And of course, we are very thankful for his time and dedication to be with us to talk about mental health. Thank you so much, Dr. Manner. Let us start with, with a short prayer to pray all together. Please, please sit. Keep the seat. Stay seated. Stay seated. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you wish, you can make me clean. That was the leper's plea in front of Jesus that shows his utter confidence in Jesus' power. He does not ask Jesus to heal him, but to make him clean. His deepest desire is to be free once again to partake in the worship of God's people. Dear Jesus, we need before you in supplication and reverence and ask you to heal our body and clean our heart from all that hurt our relationship with you. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Like to... Thank you, Abuna, for having me, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. And so I am asked to talk to you about mental health, psychiatric disorders in general, and also substance use. So I have a lot of slides I'm going to show, but it's mostly statistics and things like that, and some of them are more about how the brain works, and, and it's sort of really mostly to have a conversation. I want to leave some time at the end and to ask your questions. And so let's, let's hope we get to make the best out of this. And uh, to start with, really, it's very important to know that any parents from any ancestry, right, they always would really, you know, like to or expect their children to follow their own cultures, their own education, and their expectations. Right? So that's not unique to really our, our culture or our uh, cultural beliefs. Now, what is unique is about, you probably already know that, I don't need to tell you, but, but it is important to be clear that Lebanese people in general are very competitive and also are conservative in general. Now, of course, people, different uh, families are different, so we have cultures within the culture. So when we talk about culture, we always want to know that every family has its own culture, right? So it's not universal. So don't get me wrong, there is no universal culture, even in Lebanon or here in the US. For, 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 a, for an example, there are people in, in, in the US, here in Houston, that are even more conservative than we can be in general. And some others actually may be even more competitive. So, so you see what I mean? There are differences. It's not just across the board, like everybody's the same. And, um, so what is interesting, and that may be of interest to you as, as the youth of uh, descendants from Lebanese origin, or, or Middle Eastern for that matter, is that there is a struggle. People who are immigrants, they have their kids here, or people who were born here, and they have kids. So this is like, you know, the immigrants from the first generation. The kids of these generations, they do struggle to figure out what do they belong to? Do they belong to Lebanon, really, their density, or is it in the US? That's all of you, basically. I'm talking to you. Or is it a little bit of both? So it's an ongoing push and pull and tension. Now, that tension can be useful because then it can put you and make you be unique, which you are, right? And to accept the society and be different and do things. Now, sometimes that tension may go the wrong way and may create difficulties within the family. People may become, you know, they have difficulty in their relationship, break down the relationship. But also sometimes that may lead to other things, like mental health disorders or substance use. Now that's not any fault of anyone in particular. What happens is that we all have genetic vulnerability, 
right? So our genes that become men already have some vulnerabilities to anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia. These are the disorders that are common ones, right? Schizophrenia is not as common, it's 1% of the population. So it's a rare disorder, it's really the worst of all. This is where people say, oh, he's crazy, or he's new. You know, that's schizophrenia. That's really the worst diagnosis of all. And it's very disabling, very difficult way to treat, but that, thankfully it's rare, it's 1% of the population. Bipolar disorder, people who have like, you know, ups and downs in their mood, not every day, but usually, you know, they go through periods of ups, meaning becoming manic and then depressed, that's also rare, it's about 1%. What is really more common are things like depression and anxiety, Insomnia, actually statistics show that maybe even up to a third of the US population struggles with sleep at some point or another, so it's a very common thing. Why, why that matters? Because when we go through a lot of things chronically, meaning exposed to stress, like what we're talking about, the conflict in the family or difficulty adjusting to the culture where we're living in, that chronic stress predisposes people to develop these things. We all have some predisposition genetically, one way or another, but you have a chronic exposure to stress, and that brings it up. That makes it happen, if you know what I mean. Mental, mental health, mental illness, or leading into using substances to try to sort of change the way we feel. So that's what we are here for. This is what we want to talk about and, and try to change us. Any questions about any of that before we get going into, into more uh, statistics? No? All right. Well, this is from SAMHSA. SAMHSA is the Substance uh, Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. This is the federal government doing statistics every 10 years or so. They, you know, check on the population, see what's going on. And you see there is this uptick in mental health. And this particular one is any mental illness, right? So unfortunately, life is getting complicated. And there's a lot of stressors, and that's what we think is going on here. But what's interesting also to see is like among even kids, this is major depressive disorder. This is a diagnosis, not just feeling stressed. And this is kids from 12 to 17. You see how it's really skyrocketing almost in the last 10 or so years. And that's the top, the, the top line. And the bottom line is not only having a diagnosis, but also having impairment, meaning that's impacting somebody's ability to function. That's not good. And so this is nothing to do with us or our culture or et cetera. This is just across the population. And so we live in this country, so we are affected by it, right? But also substance use. There's a lot of substance use. And alcohol is, of course, the number one that is everybody almost drinks. 65% of the population drinks alcohol. Doesn't mean that they're alcoholic, but they just drink. And then you have tobacco. Now, tobacco. It's a bit different because tobacco is almost everybody who uses tobacco are dependent on it. You see how it's different than alcohol. Alcohol, not everybody gets dependent on it, we all drink here and there. But tobacco can be much, much more addictive than you see. And then marijuana is next, and then, you know, everything else, we're not going to get to it. But the point is that there's 60% of the population uses one substance or another in the past month when they're asked. Now, when you put uh, things in together, like you know, like you see here, the substance use and depression, and then you see how how that you know the, the top line is the co-occurring between substance use and depression, and the lower one is how it goes along with the impairment, right? So there's always an impairment when you have um, things together, of course, and other. Now, this is actually also from SAMHSA. It's the substance use among adults, age 18 and older by the mental illness status. So you can see here, you know, people who have, like, the, the, the blue one, the darker blue, is any mental illness. The, the blue, uh, the lighter blue, is the serious mental, uh, serious mental illness, which is the higher one of all, all of us. And the red is no mental illness. Why does that matter? You see, and it's the same almost pattern across all substances. You know, illicit drugs, marijuana, opiates, benzene, alcohol, and cigarettes. Why it matters? Because you see the lighter blue is the serious mental disease, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, PTSD, or severe depression. That's what I mean by serious mental disease. It's disabling. It's not just having something or another. So the more you have, 
disabling things, the more likely that you'd be involved in any of the substances. And compared with the rat, which doesn't have mental illness, you see it's a lot. So, so there is this sort of uh, join to the hip, as they say sometimes, between mental illness and substance use. It does not mean that people who have mental illness are going to be all using substance use. And it does not mean that people who use substances are all going to have mental illness, right? So they are separate. Uh, sometimes people have one or the other, but there's a good, good amount of you know being together and, and impacting people's functioning. And so that's important to be aware of. One of the things you said about tobacco is important because tobacco is almost 80% that's for the you know general number of people who use any form of tobacco may be dependent on it. It's not a central matter, it's especially if it's smoking or electronic cigarettes. We'll get to that later. So cigarettes, cigars, smokers, tobacco, pipe tobacco are the, the, the major categories. And one of the other things that speaking of substances is important to know that when people have studied this throughout the year, University of Michigan has this, uh, this uh, study that's called Monitoring the Future, if you're interested in it, to, to look at it there. They've been doing it for 40 years, and they follow all substances among the you know, young population. They see every time that the perception of harm is reduced, meaning that you know, people start thinking, oh, that's okay, that's not that bad. The use of the substance goes up. Every time the substance is more available, meaning you know, people can find it there readily, the use of the substance goes up. So these are the two things that always are correlated, related to using substance. Perception of harm, meaning if I feel like something's not bad, no, I'll do it more, more likely, and the availability of it, if I can find it, right? It makes sense, but we don't know that until we study. So this actually tells you something that the perception of harm from smoking marijuana once or twice a week, only 30% of kids who are 12 years and old, older perceive it as, as not, not good for them, as bad. That's, that's not correct, that's wrong, right? Marijuana is not good. <laughs> Take it from me. People say, oh, marijuana is natural, marijuana is okay, marijuana is not as bad as alcohol. It is as bad or worse than alcohol especially if you are smoking it. Because anything that we smoke, it's the smoke that really damages, you know, damages our lungs and creates cancers and heart attacks all along us, right? Sometimes people argue, well, marijuana is good for pain and it's good for spasticity and it's good for appetite and all these things. Well, we say, yes, there are some substances within the marijuana that do that. But the problem is once you use smoke, we want to get them all together, including the toxins. And I say that to you because you're, you're young and people you know, are open to experimenting. Experimenting is one thing, but using a substance on an ongoing basis is another thing. Anyone who uses any substance on the long run will have some impact or another on the long run. Okay? Just to be clear on that. So you see, then using cocaine once or twice a week, at least 86% of you know, people realize that that's not good. Using heroin, 94%, that's, that's good. That's what we want, right? People can understand these things are not good. Drinking four or five drinks of alcohol nearly every day. I mean, that's serious business, right? But not a lot of people see it as that. Smoking one or more packs of cigarettes per day, only 70% of people think it's bad. It's terrible. <laughs> Smoking cigarettes one pack a day, is probably, as for your health, is probably the worst than any of these things, believe it or not. For your health, right? Other than for problem in life. So, so, so we have a lot of education to do in the general public, right? Let alone the culture, let alone the, uh, the thing. So, how do we get there? How do we, you wonder, like, okay, we just said experimenting is part of life, we try this, try that, go on, no problem, right? But how do we get hooked on something? How do we get, like, we cannot stop using a substance, become addicted to it? Well, there is something in our brain, it's called the reward pathway, and that's what actually gets started this addiction process. The, the reward pathway is 
as we see there where that arrow says the reward, these are two centers, specifically the center of the brain, that they get highlighted when we do something that is pleasurable, something that we feel like we like or feel like pleasure. These centers get, you know, highlighted, you know, the activity is that goes up in the brain. Now the brain has different areas with different things. Like this is the side, this is the front. So, so our eyes will be here on this side, and the vision, interesting enough, is all the way in the back. It's sort of, I don't know why God did this, but maybe one day we'll ask him, but it's, we see here, but the, it gets processed all the way in the back, okay? In the middle of the brain, this area here is all where the emotions are generated, and this is where that pleasure centers are. Now all these things, this is like a simplification of what's in the brain. They all are connected with each other. They're not just sort of, you know, randomly sitting there. So one of the connections, very important, this central segmental area, the intercircumference are the centers of where we, you know, get highlighted when we do something for fun, are interacting with this prefrontal cortex. This prefrontal cortex is, you know, before the frontal, that's why it's called prefrontal. Has anyone heard about this before? Ever? Yes? Okay, what is it? What does it do? This big one of Oh, you didn't pay attention? Oh my goodness, I didn't hear that. That's fine. Yeah. Executive function of the brain? What is it? Executive function? Executive function of the brain. And this is where the decision of good or not good in our brain, and how we process this is dangerous, this is not good for me, I should do this, I shouldn't do that, and then, you know, it goes to the rest of the brain to carry on the action, right? What, how, when do you think, what age do you think we get that part of the brain matured enough, or finalized, you know, the maturity? 25. 25. Are you a biology major or something? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, good job, that's awesome. Chris. Most people don't know that, you see? Most people think it's 18, you know, because we get adults, etc. Of course, we sign up for war when we're 18, and so, but this is still developed. Well, maybe that's why we sign up for war, because we're not thinking about the dangers, you see, that we could face. You know, it's not like people are crazy, man, but we just don't see the dangers. We don't see them as dangerous as an adult would. And that is used to be developed until 25, believe it or not. And I always thought, just you know, I always thought when, if you have any kids, your parents might know that, like when your kids start driving, your insurance goes up to double or whatever, right? I always thought, this is crazy, why do I do this, right? And then guess what? It just goes back to normal when you reach what? 25. 25. How about that? I mean, you know, this is, well, they don't base it on this, they base it on statistics, right? They, they follow the statistics. And they, they see that people who are above 25 are less likely to get into a car accident, so the insurance goes down. If you have tried to rent a car, they won't rent your car until you're 25. Same thing, because you may get them, you know, into an accident or whatever, break their car or vandalize, but, you know, but so that's interesting because that is the area also, as we're saying, that when you have some pleasure, it tells your part of the brain to, you know, it's okay. I want to do this more more, you know, just don't worry about this danger thing, and we end up doing it again, and again, you know, eventually this becomes a repetitive process, right, and becomes really what we call impulsive, so it just doesn't stop, no matter whether there is pleasure or not, we just keep doing it, and that's when we call it addiction. You see how it starts from experimenting, having fun, but the more we do, the more we get, it becomes automatic, and it has a life of its own. And that's when you cannot stop by yourself, you need help. You see, like, you all, I don't know, you probably, none of you were born in the time of Nancy Reagan, but the rest of you might know, she was advocating for this campaign of just saying no, right? For kids against drugs and all that, which is fine. For you all, if you haven't started to do something, right, just say no and stay away, that's fantastic. But once somebody starts and become addicted, that's not enough anymore. They need help, they need treatment, etc. Right? You're asking something? Or you having something? I always thought, you know, 18. <laughs> I always thought 18 for uh, women and 25 for men, but it's not true. It, apparently, it's 
just keeps, I mean, the, the changes are very, very small, right? But they, they still develop against the 25, yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, electronics, like gaming, and this kind of addiction, how does it fit in this? Uh, what kind of health yeah. huh? do we need? <laughs> Don't answer it. <laughs> is, is that your dad? They didn't like it. <laughs> electronics, it's an addiction, how does it fit there? I didn't like the question. <laughs> no, I didn't. All right. So this is actually anything that gives us reward, right? Anything really, like bungee jumping. If somebody likes bungee jumping, you know, they will get a big rush there. Like, so anything, including electronics or whatever, gambling, you keep doing it, you keep getting that kick out of it. At some point, again, the behavior becomes circular. Like it just it skips all that. It just keeps going. You cannot stop, right? Including Gambling, gaming, all of it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Question? Yes. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking about the last thing, which is I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Just getting into the mic. Oh, the mic. Yeah. I don't think it was my voice. Oh, no, sure. sure. Okay, you, 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 you are reading, 
following the computer, which is basically opened that path, if you would, and created it, then now we start injecting what we refer to as the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, th th that's what I'm after. Is, is there a relationship, or do they follow a different path? Well, Sorry, thanks. No, that's good, that's good. So now the answer is, it depends. Right? So this is the best answer you're doing, it matters. It depends because, of course, good habits, like sports, it's actually healthy. It's really engaging different parts of the brain. It's not the only part there, right? It's engaging different parts. It's really overall health. The person's feeling good. The, the good habit meaning in their life. If it's one of those other things like alcohol or gambling or you know gaming or whatnot that can lead, it's not if you overdo it, it can lead to illness or whatever, then yeah, you're on that edge. Depending on what you do, you could fall into it. So that's kind of how it has a thing, right? Now, one of those things that really is very hard to beat, as you see, is, for instance, addiction to food, right? Because, for instance, you are an alcoholic, well, okay, well, you know, one of the parts of the treatment is to stay away from bars, stay away from drinking, and you still will live. Nothing happens, but it's going to be hard because you're craving, you want to do it. But can you stop eating? You know? And, and food is not bad, I mean, you need to see that's one of those that gets crossed like that, it makes it very hard for people to, you know, control it eventually. Right? Yeah, doctor, mm -hmm. one more question, and then we will leave you to come to finish yeah. your presentation, yeah. and then you can keep your questions oh. for the last. No, do your question, yeah, right? this question, question yeah. because you asked for it. It's more fun like this. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Um, I know, like, like when you take like certain medicine for a while, like the effects start to like of the medicine wear off and doesn't work. Is it like this kind of? Is that does it happen with addiction? Like if someone's addicted to alcohol, like eventually, like it like starts affecting them less or? Mm -hmm. So that that's actually very very also important because I tell you that there's something called homeostasis mm -hmm. in the body and the brain. That our body and brain adjust to everything and everything we do, right? In the substances world, when you're drinking or smoking something, it's called tolerance. You build tolerance to it, so it doesn't impact you as much. You get used to it, so you end up using more of it, which then the consequences are worse. You see how that develops, and that back to this question: how it becomes, you know, an addiction or, or bad addiction is when these things are a bit developing, becoming automatic, and then more and more, then you just lose control, and that's key when you lose control here with addiction. Yeah. So does that mean it becomes a gateway? Like, like if you built up a tolerance to mm -hmm. alcohol, then you want to move on to something more. Fantastic. You guys are awesome, really. You're asking the beautiful questions, the best. You're making my job much easier, you're making it fun. Gateway. You've heard that before, the gateway theory, that people who in the 70s and maybe 80s, we thought that marijuana, cannabis, you know, smoking is the gateway drug. That evolved. And sometimes people think nicotine, you know, smoking is the gateway drug, right? Exactly. The current understanding is that any drug can be and would be a gateway drug because we have only one system, as we're saying, right? Back to this idea. So it doesn't matter really what drug it is, it can become a gateway drug. Because okay? like you start to become immune to it, you want, like, mm -hmm. say that, like, it gives you, like, a buzz. Yeah. Okay. It gives you, like, a... Oh. If it gives you like a buzz or something and then you don't get it anymore, then you move on to something greater. Yeah, that's exactly right. Either you use more of it or you get something stronger. Exactly, yes. That's exactly what happens. And so, now this is, we're going to show you this in a different view. Of course, the same brain, the same way. Was there anything else? No? No. no. Okay. That's the same brain, the different view. But this is actually what's called fMRI, which is functional magnetic resonance imaging, right? What that is getting is measuring really the blood flow into the brain, which is the brain really gets more blood flow to certain areas. It's very efficient, by the way. It's not always you know, flowing the blood everywhere. It is, but it gets more blood, more into areas that we're using. You see, it's very efficient and sort of like kind of diverting the flow. So we use that to see where there is activity. This top one is when they're measuring some putting somebody in the scanner and expand, um, exposing them to their drug or talking about their drug, they start craving it. And you see how that area, that same area we're talking about, how it just gets highlighted because the brain diverts the blood there because that's active, right? It needs to give it nourishment, right? Next, they ask them to resist the craving or try to resist. And look what 
activates this other area, which is what we were just talking about, right? The area where judgment and decisions and So this is to say that this is not only, you know, in animals and experiments, this is real. It's real humans in alive, basically, when they are scanned their brain, you see that process. Okay? So People then ask, well, what's this reward? Why don't we just cut it off if somebody's addicted? And they're not addicted anymore. Why? It's because this reward pathway wasn't meant for problems or addiction. It was meant for food, for water, for sex, social nutrition, things that we get pleasure from, certain level of pleasure, not the same as drugs. But then the drugs hijack that to a level that you cannot stop, you see? That's why. And so this is actually a little bit more expansion on that same concept. To show you all these different pathways and different colors. And I'm not going to get into that because it's sort of a bit more advanced, if you wish, knowledge. But just so you know, every single one of those pathways has its own function in the brain. And they're all intertwined. So you cannot just separate one thing or another, right? So it's all, if somebody's addicted or they have a mental health problem and they are using substances, it gets even more complex. To give you an example, this GABAergic is the one that helps us to you know, be calm. That's the GABAergic system. Glutamatergic is the one that keeps us alert and awake, so they kind of work in concert you know, with each other. It's like during the day, one is more active than the other. Dopaminergic is the one that dopamine, the one that the pleasure and the reward that we're talking about, the memory and things like that. Epidergic is the appetite. Neurodynergic and serotonergic are the mood and the anxiety, just to kind of Give you an example of what we're, we're talking about. And that's how complex it can be on the cellular level, meaning on the molecules themselves, those centers we talked about. Different drugs work different ways. It's very complex. But so, so it's not easy to just say, oh, this drug does this in general, because it may be doing different things for different people depending on their balance. Okay? Oh, I want to show you that video. Let's see. Do we have time? Oh, how yes, do we yes, have time? we have time. This is the video that. If I could get it going, it would be fun to see because it's actually a National Geographic video that just talks about all that, but in a visually appealing kind of way. Nice. Uh, oops, did we get some talking? Maybe when we put the screen Abuna. Abuna. Unplug the HDMI and plug and it back, back in. Uh, oh, that, but how about the book? Is it a sound? Does it sound? Does it sound? Does it sound? Does it So this is just the most we get going. This is a video about what we're talking about. It just shows you all of these things, how they interact with each other. If you could pull it up, if not, we'll... Abuna, press the skate. that we seek to push our pleasure buttons. But what happens when this need for pleasure becomes a full-time pursuit? When our fix turns into something more like a dependence? It used to be that addiction was considered a sort of moral failing. But now, with a much better understanding of how the human brain works, scientists are learning new clues about the vicious cycle of desire, binging, and withdrawal that traps tens of millions of people. 
Our brains evolved the reward system based on a chemical called dopamine. This amazing neurotransmitter creates cravings in us to encourage behaviors that help us survive, such as eating, procreating, or interacting socially. In turn, pleasure is then stimulated by other neurotransmitters in hedonic hotspots of the brain. When dopamine's craving circuitry overwhelms the pleasure hotspots, addiction occurs. Essentially, your reward system is hijacked. Let's break it down this way. Your desires are triggered when dopamine, starting at the top of the brainstem, travels through neural pathways to affect the brain. Drugs increase this flow of dopamine. Where does the dopamine go? It flows throughout the brain's craving circuit, including the dorsal striatum, where brain nerve cells called neurons begin to form habits by IDing fun things that you've done, like buying drugs or cigarettes. Dopamine also goes to the prefrontal cortex, where with the help of an amino acid called glutamate, rich visualizations that cue cravings are conjured. Think images of drug paraphernalia, sex, or a bottle of booze. Then there's the amygdala, where the dopamine causes neurons here to be stimulated by learned emotional responses, like rich, leisure-coded memories. So what happens when drugs artificially flood these pathways with dopamine? For one thing, the rush can rewire your brain to want more drugs, and thus create addiction. But it turns out different drugs interact with the reward system in unique and interesting ways. Cocaine, for example, blocks dopamine transporters and prevents the removal of excess dopamine from synapses. Methamphetamine, on the other hand, floods the terminals of neurons, displacing dopamine into synapses instead. And heroin blocks dopamine inhibitors, causing synapses to flood with dopamine without restraint. The good news? With a refined understanding of the devastating effects of these drugs comes new angles and approaches to the treatment of addiction that have shown remarkable promise. Cocaine addicts have been able to shut off their cravings abruptly when electromagnetic pulses are applied to their prefrontal cortex. A drug hitherto used to treat muscle spasms called baclofen has shown promise for treating alcohol dependence. As more and more of our friends and family are affected by crippling addiction, it's comforting to know that we are finally finding effective ways to take our brains back. Learning to ride a bicycle. You know, when you're 
five, six years old, it takes you six months, a year of training wheels, and then you take one, and then the other one, and then you ride. I come and later on, you go to a big city, you cannot ride a bicycle, then you come back home, you have your bicycle, it's three, four, five years, whatever it is. You think you need training wise, the wheels, or time, you just go on a bicycle and you ride. It's there, it's sitting there, just, you know, maybe a little bit choppy at the beginning, right? That's the same process. Almost like a follow up to what you just said. My question is I mean, like after being at getting the addiction, become an addicted, and after you cure it, because I mean, it becomes a permanent damage. I mean, that my question is is it a complete permanent damage, or after the treatment and opening, let's say, removing these blockers, if you would, the can you use the same passage for, for whatever you? Being addicted to, can you follow the same path and inject, make it as a habit? In other words, use the same path because you cannot reverse. Until mm -hmm. you get to the point, they cannot be reversed. Can you use the same message for something better? Oh, I mean, the, the, the reverse yeah. process, and even because you said, I, I mean, I did like what you just said that okay, it stays in the brain, and especially that the, the areas where mm -hmm. you, you don't treat it. Mm -hmm. But can you use it for something? So the way, it, this is very complex, as I was showing earlier, so it's really every drug has its own sort of different pathways, although they lead the same, you know, common pathway, as we call it. So what we try to do with the, you know, rehabilitation and the abstinence and the recovery, we, these are the terms that we use. We don't, we don't use the term of cure because nobody gets cured from addiction. You are in recovery, so you recover, but you're always vulnerable to it because of that. So what, what we do is try to teach the brain, people do different behaviors, healthier behaviors, so they have different ways to cope with their stresses, right? So while it is still using that same, of course, your pathway is not triggering it in the same way, right? That it works, if that answers the question a little bit. So you cannot really use exactly the same pathways, but it's sort of, you learn in different ways. You learn we create newer pathways. That's how we think it works, right? I have a question. Uh, and we have two questions yeah, here. Yeah. But I have a question before. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any studies that show the role of faith uh, prayer or spiritual life in general that can help with the addiction or mental health? Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for reminding me on that. So faith is really, really crucial for recovery. Speaking of doing things different now, learning new things, people mistaken that by thinking that addiction is a weakness of character or that it's a, you know something that the person is not strong enough, so that's why they got into it. That's not the case. It's different. Again, we talk about the genetics, we talk about the environmental, you know, cultural differences, you know, influences. People get addicted for many different ways. Faith is one of those, what you're asking about, healthier ways to open up different parts of our brain and give us strength to face the addiction. So it's not necessarily because addiction is a weakness of character or weakness of faith or not. It's just because we can rely on it to recover. One of the things, the 12-step movement, the like AA, you've heard of an alcoholic anonymous, and that's one of the central tenets that they have. They don't say, they don't, they're not denominational, they don't call it one religion or another, but they trust the higher power, right? So because they want it to be you know, welcoming everybody, not just one or another faith. But that's what they're talking about. Their, their, their main tenet, and it's very powerful, is to say, you, you know, trust a higher power to help me get out of this thing, right? So it's not anymore I'm trying to beat this drug. I trust the higher power to help me, and I'll do my part. So which is the same principle, same common, you know, how to take In a scientific way, as science agrees on this way also as a way to help. Yeah, people have studied AA and how it works, and the faith in it mm -hmm. is central tenet. And the second part is the congregational part, the social, which is what we do in our faith anyway. Yes. We come to church every Sunday, right? We support each other. So you see how that kind of perfectly works? Yeah. So the part of the brain that's uh, decision making, that's the prefrontal cortex, is that what you call it? Uh, what's the name of it? The prefrontal pre pre um, cortex. So basically, if someone like knows that doing drugs is wrong and they do it and the drug hijacks that part of the brain, 
does it trick the brain into thinking in the future that drugs are good for them, so that's why they keep taking it? it, it what it does, it just keeps um, keeps sort of, you know, putting, putting the left area of the brain aside, you know, keeps saying, ah, it's okay, you know, I want to get this. And the more they do it, the more this becomes more of an aside. They come up with reasons or excuses why it's okay. That's how it works. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's say you are addicted to alcohol and then you stop. So can you uh, drink alcohol occasionally after and why or not? That's another fantastic question. I tell you, you guys are fantastic. I'm not kidding. Really, this is a great question. It's wonderful to get us, you know, thinking about these things. So most people, once they're addicted to a substance like alcohol, they, they, it's impossible almost for them to use it in a like like everybody else, just a little bit. Because the minute that they get it again, it gets them all the way. Most people, right? But people are different, you know? We're not all the same. So once in a while, you hear stories of people who were addicted to alcohol and they can drink here and there and they're okay, but that's rare. Most people, they cannot do it. Once they're addicted, they have to just totally stop because that's, you know, keep them that way. Uh, is hookah or do you think considered an addictive drug that also has the same effects? Oh yeah, well yeah, fortunately, the argile, you see, that's another very good question. Yeah, the argile, you know, because the design of it, I don't know if they designed it to be beautiful and bubbly, <laughs> or is it they thought that that may reduce the harm because going through the war? But apparently it gives that impression, oh, well, it's going through the water, it might be purifying, right? It doesn't actually purify anything. <laughs> yeah, it's actually, in fact, the carbon monoxide in the argile is many times more than smoking because of the closed system. There's not the full burning, right? So, you know, among other things. But yeah, it's definitely addicting and definitely problematic with the breathing and all those things. And, now, of course, there's some differences, like people who smoke cigarettes are smoking all day long. Uh, either they usually they just use it for half an hour, an hour, so that may be, if you want to think of it, less harmful in that way, but it is addicting, and, yeah. Then, more, no? two more questions. Yes, sure. Yeah, all, all of the have yet from here on are our statistics, so this is important, actually. Go ahead. So, um, when, you, when you do get addicted, I... Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so when like some people they use like drugs or alcohol as an escape an escape from like something they're going through, can that be considered more like addicting and harder to draw back from because you're using it um, to cover up like trauma or something that you're going through? Yeah. <laughs> the, the more the more that is the case, the more the harder it will be to let go of the drug, right? But again, remember, not everybody who uses drugs is because of the reason. Sometimes just for extra minutes to make it look good, right? But if there are other reasons or they're trying to, then it becomes even harder. I know typically it probably, I mean, it depends, but. Oh, uh, <laughs> where is the microphone? <laughs> I thought you did. Yeah, that's my question. Like. Uh, <laughs> typically, how long does it take you to, like, typically, because I know it's probably different for every patient, but, like, how long does it typically take you to, like, diagnose someone with either addiction or a mental disorder? How long does it take me? Or. I'm pretty quick, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, does it take, like, multiple times, like, multiple sessions, or, like, just, like, like how? Well, well, yeah, well, the, most of the time in, in one session we could get a good picture of really what's going on. Sometimes we need to interview family and friends and others, especially with like kids, you know, or, or you know, the younger you go, then you need to interview other people. But most of the time, is, unless the person themselves is lying, right, or misrepresenting, then of course it just it makes it harder. But most of the time people are, you know, honest and they say things, uh, and if not, then time will tell. You see, if you follow up, <laughs> then you find out that it's not true. Okay, so, um, in order to reopen up an addiction, you don't have to, like, use the drug itself. It's like any chemical that was in the drug. Is that why they, like, when you're, like, about to go into surgery, they make you fill out, like, a survey if you did, like, substance abuse before? Well, that... So when you go into surgery, they ask you yes, because if you have tolerance to yeah. substance, you may need more 
back then, so we no longer will get those. It's like, I went to this other one once about a guy that he abused cocaine like a lot, and then like he quit for like 10 years, right? And then he went to surgery, but like, he didn't fill that part out because he didn't think it was important. And then like, once they put him under anesthesia, like the, like the drug for like whatever it was, like came back and like it ruined his life. Oh, that part, okay, that, that's a different thing. Yeah, I thought you were talking about the level of uh, anesthetic. You were talking about after the anesthesia, after surgery. That does happen too, because of what we're saying, right? If you're addicted to something, it only takes one time to use again and bring it all back up. So think about if somebody's in, you know, addicted to opioids, right? Heroin or whatever, morphine or whatever. You go to a surgery, what they use for the pain is our opiates. You know, fentanyl is one of them. It brings you all the way, yes, of course, even if you're not using it voluntarily, you wake up, you feel just this craving, and then you end up, yeah, absolutely. That's why they ask those questions, that's why people who are vulnerable, they actually may need to be on a medication to help them not to fall into it, you know, surgery, or use other anesthetics as much as possible that don't have opioids, and that kind of thing, yeah. I thought they operated without anesthesia. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, honest. On a scale of 1 to 10, how bad are drugs? How bad are drugs? They are bad. Really? Does no, Jesus bad. love me if I'm under the influence? I will, I will answer this question. <laughs> 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 the first part. Oh my god. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me say something about that. Because I'll tell you, different drugs are totally different. Okay? And that's good make very good use of your question, of your, your inquisitive mind here. Like for instance, opioids, right? You know what opioids? Like fentanyl and uh, morphine and uh, methadone and all these, right? Uh, oxy, oxycontin, these are opioids are called, right? Those, those drugs are medicine, we use them for pain. They don't have any effect on the body. Zero, we don't have them, nothing. They do cause addiction, that's the only effect that we know of to the body. But listen to this. They can kill you immediately, right? If you're not tolerant and if you overdose, you die right there in the moment. You see? See how that goes? So they don't have any, they don't cause any illnesses. They don't cause heart attack, they don't cause, you know, uh, cancer, they don't cause, you know, asthma, COPD, like smoking would. You see? Like smoking is the worst of them all as far as disease is. It doesn't kill you right away. It takes 10 to 15 years to get to have the disease. See how it's different? So on the scale of what well, <laughs> it's different drugs are different, right? So so if you're using one of those, you can die now and there is no tomorrow. You see it? And if you're using, say, like smoking, well, it's bad, but on the long run. So yeah, it is all most drugs are not good for you, if that's what you're wondering. It is 10 for most drugs, right? And so some substances may not be as dangerous, like alcohol in moderation, for instance, you know, it's okay. That's why most people don't have a problem with it. You see what I mean? So there's no, like, one answer to all, but we only think of it this way. Oh, so yeah. if they fall, like, in the same scale, why is alcohol legal, but, like, marijuana yeah, and that's why I'm glad you asked that, because that's a very, very kind of confusing thing, especially for you, I can tell you, with my own kids, I hope they're not watching, because then they, they pick on me at home. One time we were in the car in the summer, and they were telling me, yeah, but medical marijuana is okay, it's medical, it should be okay, why, what's the big deal? I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on, don't fall for these, you know, tricks. These are political tricks that people use to get marijuana legalized eventually. There is no medical marijuana. There is no such a thing. They're using us, basically, to legalize marijuana in a different way. Marijuana is marijuana, whether you use it for fun or for whatever other purpose, you see? So, so marijuana, smoking marijuana is bad for your health, if that's what you're wondering. Now, edibles, this may be different. It's not as bad. It may be addictive eventually, but you see how you start thinking about it like in different terms, right? It's not just all in one. So that's why when people say, oh, medical marijuana should be okay, and everything is fine, well, yeah, I mean, if they're smoking it, this still is marijuana. Now, if somebody has cancer, they're not eating 
and they need to stimulate their health, they're going to die in the six months or a year, then of course, well, you know, I mean, it's, it's okay. But let's not call it medical marijuana. Let's call it marijuana for them because they're going to die. Do you see what I mean? Yes. So don't fall for those sort of mis kind of conceptions and simple political things, do you? So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, Dr. Yeah. Uh, my question is regarding us people from the Middle East. How does yes. our culture compare to different cultures as far as mental health? Oh, we, we have, we, let me say one thing about that. Mental health is always, there's always this stigma, right? You've heard that word stigma. What it means is that there's always a patch label. The minute we say mental health, everybody cringes. Any culture, everywhere, including here. This country is much better than any other country in the world in being open. Europe also. But other countries all over is terrible. People, they, they don't accept mental illness anywhere in the world. They think of it as the weakness of the character. They think of it as just stupidity or whatever. They come up with different, you know, words. Like the, like the, the Far East, you know, China and Japan and, you know, all the Eastern nations. They do, doesn't exist. You know, people go into the, they get depressed, they go into having pain, you know, because they somatize their depression into their body. They don't, they, they, it's not acceptable to talk about depression because of just weakness, right? So I go in, my shoulder is hurting, my leg is hurting, or whatever, and in reality, it's emotional pain is getting transmitted to that body. So our culture is no different. We're very, very, you know, still not accepting mental illness at all, yeah? Unfortunately. Without having addiction, so but sometimes both of them happen at the same time. So there, you know, there are three different kind of types, if you will. So somebody could be. Most people have, you know, no addiction and no mental health and no substance, thankfully. So, but some people have this, some people have that, some people have both. Is that yeah? Mm -hmm. Hello, Dad. Um, my question is: Is the least drugs to treat is the marijuana or all the same level marijuana, heroin? And that's actually also, I was going to get to that to tell you. So you see, I was saying earlier, different drugs are different, but also the way you administer the drug is also impactful. Let me use this example. Like this one here, this is the heart, these are the lungs, this is the brain, of course. This is snorting cocaine. You know how somebody snorts cocaine, and, and you see it in the movies probably, but it goes to their nostril, then it goes to the venous system, to the right side of the heart, and then to the lungs, then to the left side of the heart, and then to the brain. That takes about five minutes to kind of circulate. That blunts it down, you see? It makes it much smoother because it gets diluted and all that. If somebody smoked cocaine, by the way, if you smoke regular cocaine, you burn it. It doesn't do anything, but that's what they do, crack cocaine. You see, crack cocaine is like a different chemical way to, I'm not going to get into that, but you know what I mean. It, when they smoke crack cocaine, it goes to the lungs and directly to the brain. Seven seconds, usually, seven to ten seconds. So instead of five minutes, you see, that by itself makes anything more addictive when you smoke it. To start with, the dose that you get, the level of the drug, also is much higher because it skips everything else, just goes directly, and that also makes it more addictive. So that's why smoking, is more addictive than chewing tobacco. Smoking crack cocaine is more addictive than snorting cocaine. They both are addictive, right? But you see what I mean? So the same drug, depending how you administer it, you know, it gets to be more addictive. What, one, one common, actually, question for, believe it or not, the medical boards that, that they ask for the students, you know, at that boards, is what's the fastest way to get the drug to your brain? And they put the lungs, IV, you know, intravenous, 
rectal or oral, and almost everybody falls for the intravenous. You know, because you think, well, the beer, I mean, what's faster than putting it in your vein? You see, it's not. It's <laughs> the lungs. It's the fastest way to get to the brain. Okay. Another thing, doctor. What's is it? Is it the person who into drugs can affect his kids? I mean, is this hereditary? I mean, is yeah. this yeah. Yeah. So genetic. Yes, it is. It, 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 there is there is genetics, and there is something called you know you know peri genetics. You know, or advanced. so so basically our genes are changing as we live, right? So. Um, so yes, people carry some of the genetic source from their parents, whether it's inherited from their own parents or their own, you know, their life, etc. But also the environment where people live, the family environment. If somebody is in the family is using substance, especially if they are you know, authority figures like the parents, it definitely impacts everybody else, including the kids. Yeah, as we all know, I mean the key to uh, Resolving any problem, I mean, the patient has to admit that there is a problem. You know, and the denial is, I see this very common, you know, like most people don't even admit that they have a problem. So, how is that being worked on? Is it as part of the same treatment or it's like separate treatment to at least get them to admit that yes, there's a problem? Yeah, that, that's very important. I mean, in, in anything in life, right? If we don't see a problem, we're not going to fix it. You see, that's what that has to do. And unfortunately, you see how you were asking earlier, how that part of the brain, how it sort of kind of works in the judgment. If you keep telling your brain it's okay, you know, just get it, and you keep doing it, that part of the brain becomes just, you know, just uh, totally ignored. Yeah. And that's where the night comes along. There's no problem, where's the problem, right? So the only way to get to that is what we call sometimes, you've heard it in the movies or something, intervention, right? You get as many people as you can who care about that person together. First they talk with each other, of course it's a planet. They get together and express that to them, to tell them, hey, I am worried about you because X, Y, and Z, the other person, X, Y, and Z. So they realize it's not just one person, you know, against them, but the whole family is worried. They want them to do something, and you hope that that works. If it doesn't, there's not much you can do to shake somebody up. The other thing that helps them sometimes are consequences. You know, if you are you know, gambling and you lost now your car and then your house, that's a consequence. If you are using heroin and you barely made it, you overdose and they use naloxone to revive you and you know now that, that's a big consequence. Usually wakes you up, you know, those kind of things. That's the other way that helps people to wake up from that denial. We still have 10 minutes. We have oh, three questions. Yeah, Can we take this? Yes, yes I only have, after this, I only have stuff, statistics, but I mean, there's, I was going to have to talk a bit about each subject, but that's fine, yeah. Dr. Khan, give me a sure score to a What's that? <laughs> I give the sure score to a woman. Oh, <laughs> the, the question I have, I mean, ethically, we know that, as you noted, that there are certain drugs that they, if you have to, I mean, for medical reasons, for health reasons, you have to, and they become addiction one way or another. So, mm -hmm. at what point, from your point of view, at what point do you say, okay, we need to stop mm -hmm. giving this drug to someone mm -hmm. and give something else? And, mm -hmm. as a kind of continuation of this question, how do you decide or when to change the drug, where the damage has already been done by the previous Drug, mm -hmm. And now you're trying to give something else to treat the same thing using a different drug. And how does that work? Yeah, yeah. no, but that's actually a good point as well because I tell you, there are certain drugs that we, we use medications, we call them, they can be drugs, you see. But that's good to, to separate the two. So, for instance, benzodiazepines like Valium and Adivan and Xanax and Clonopin, these are the common ones, right? That we, we call them benzodiazepines. They are used for anxiety relief. Some people are very effective. When you use them for too long, the body gets used to it. Through that homeostasis we were talking about earlier, the body gets used to anything you give it. So you need more to get the same effect. So then your physician usually raises the level and then raises it again. Sometimes when that happens is when people start like not waiting for their physician to raise the level, they just keep using more because they want to feel whatever way, 
they sold out the bike on the street and they get into all that, that becomes a problem, of course, right? So physicians usually, the savvy ones about the patient, when they go up a little bit, they go up a little bit, that's the first sign of worry that, you know, we start saying, hey, this is like getting too much, we don't need to go anywhere, let's find another type of medicine that may work for you, that is not addictive. If, you know, if, if the physician is aware and realizes that, or if they hear, or they, you know, people keep running out of their medication before time, then that's the suspicion that something's not right. Right? That is how we shift them to something else. Opioids are the same way. You know, codeine, hydrocodeine, and uh, uh, oxycontin, all these are used for medication that's for pain, are very effective, but also they create the same process that you use tolerance and you need to do more. So we try to, they're always an alternative. Unfortunately, it may not be as good for pain, for instance, but they work. You know, not, by the way, nothing works for the pain 100%, and that's part of the problem. People keep chasing, you know, trying to get better, they keep using more. Pain is difficult to treat. So whose decision is it to <coughs> make that balance between we need to go health versus addiction? Yeah, well, and, you know, some people actually use them for many years, but they don't have a problem. So it's not everybody is vulnerable to it, right? So when you see, again, the behavior becoming a problem, that's the sign of, like, uh oh something is not right. Yeah? Um, okay, my question is more about, like, um, mental health. So, like, anxiety. Everyone is stressed, but how how does that stress turn into, like, a panic attack? Like, because mm -hmm. that, I feel like, I mean, like, how do some people, when they have stress, it doesn't like mm -hmm. become that big, but with other people, you react in a different way where it's to the point where you, you know, yeah. have that thing. Yeah. yeah, so let me, let me say a word on that. So stress is actually good to a certain level, right? We, we need stress to function, basically, to a certain level, right? But it's sort of like the elastic band. You see, you pull it, and then it pulls you back. It's a good work there, right? You pull it too much, it breaks. That's the panic attack, you see? If you are way too stressed, you may have a panic attack without having genetic predisposition. Some people have the genetic predisposition, it doesn't take too much stress to trigger it. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Uh, what are the behavioral changes that we need to watch as a person, or red flag that this person is ah, using yeah. such stuff? Yeah, so that, this is very important. I was going to get to it. Thank you for reminding me. So, so we talked about all these things, and we talked about our families and how we care for each other. How do we, when do we suspect somebody is using a substance? Or when do we suspect that somebody may have a mental health problem that we need to help them with? But let's get to the substance first. Any changes in the usual routine that the person has, that's usually a flag. For instance, somebody comes in every day, they eat, and they go to study or whatever, all of a sudden they don't, they don't want to eat anymore or they don't, you know, the family, right? They just want to be on their own, alone, always on their computer, things like that. Any changes from the usual routine, that's a flag. Kids who are, or some of our kids, but also could be adults, who get irritable for no reason and for little reasons, that's another flag. Now, of course, don't take that to say, oh, it's automatically a substance use, but these are flags that would have to, you know, kind of keep an eye see what's going on, right? So, isolation, right? Being on their own, they don't want to be with anyone. Or being irritable easily, these are flags, right? Not sleeping, of course, is a big one. And, you know, again, changing the daily routine, daily demeanor, how they are. These are the flags that usually makes you wonder what's going on, I need to keep an eye on investigate, right? And what to do about it is just that. Investigate first. You don't want to automatically say, oh, he's using drugs, right? No, of course not, but you have to keep an eye. They use closer. And by the way, the best remedy, um, and I'll talk about mental health also in a second, now we can look into that. The best remedy, or not remedy, but the best prevention for any of these things is, believe it or not, is the family general. People have studied that. Any family that has family dinner, meaning they get together, at least they're not for dinner to be lunch, but usually it's dinner because people are working and in school, they get together at least once a day to be prayer. See? That is the strength of the family. That's what keeps them together, and this is the time when people talk. Even if they don't talk, they communicate, you see? 
that's the best way to prevent any of these things as much as possible. It does not cure everything, but it's the way that we could all practice, you know, the, the good way, right? Mental health, maybe you guys actually the same question, but how do we spot mental health? Well, depression, people get slowed down, adults get slowed down, and they just not kind of focus, they kind of concentrate, their appetite goes down or up, they lose sleep. Kids sometimes are a bit different, not kids, young adults, but <laughs> could be different. They could go the other way, they get irritable, and that's still no sleep or too much, it's a little bit that depression. Anxiety, of course, is nervousness, panic attacks, that's anxiety, right? But, well, we have many questions, so we can be, yeah, yes. yes. Uh -huh. Our, our value <laughs> um, So, I saw on the PowerPoint that um, when you showed the brain, that the pain and the pleasure part of the brain were right next to each other. And, uh, like, uh, just, uh, just observation. But my question is, um, mm -hmm. so we talked about that the executive function isn't, doesn't stop developing until 25. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that the use of drug and the addiction um, uh, sparks parts of uh, the executive function. So is that why we always hear that any type of abuse or substance abuse before 25 is the most dangerous time to, to do anything, even we say alcohol is okay, but even when you do it before. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah exactly. That's why the even experimentation, if somebody asks me, you know, my kids, for instance, I hope they're not watching, but they are like, that's good for us to know, that I tell them, don't experiment with something, hey, fine, but wait until your brain is developed, right? The 25 is ideal, but at least 21. You don't want to be starting to experiment with your brain is still developing, because that sort of skews the whole thing, right? And so, what you were talking about is all in that center of the brain. I thought we were getting at is that all these, the pain and the emotions, all that is the center of the brain, and the impulse, and guess what? And that's the one thing that we have in common with all of the vertebrate animals. But what we don't, what we have unique that they don't have is the other part, this cortex, this whole big thing. Actually, I don't know if it's still there. Let me show you this part here. Yeah. Oh well, the, you know, the, all the rest of it, humongous, none of the animal would have that, right? The next best one has the 10% of what we have, the, which is what? The capacity to think, process, you know, do things, stop our behavior, all that, they don't have that. But we all we share with them this, you know, the impulses, the pain, perception, the emotional, all these things they have, but they're a different level, right? But you see, that's why we call that part of the brain the primitive brain. See? So that tells you the power again of all these things, right? Yeah. Uh, what is the effect on the newborn babies if the parents are drug addicts or use drugs? Well, the effect starts in, in, in the uterus. You know, when the woman is pregnant, if she is using a substance, different substance, it has a different impact, right? Now, if there's a newborn and the parents of course, are not taking care of them, you know, that's obvious. But sometimes, actually, smoking is actually impactful to a kid, even a newborn, whether they are smoking in their presence or they're smoking outside and coming in, believe it or not. There is a new concept called third hand smoking. You know, everybody knows about second hand smoking, right? Somebody's smelling in your smoke. Now there is this concept of third hand smoke, which is stuff that gets stuck to the clothes, to the skin, that smell. That seems to be toxic to actually the kids and newborns. So pediatricians have followed that up with, with women who they know that they are smoking outside and they come in, etc., or parents. And they see that they are at more risk for ear infections and respiratory infections. That's what that concept of third hand smoke comes in, which is that smell. They may go into a part of a smoker, you smell it. Well, what is that? There's no smoke, it's all sticking there, all the oil, the toxins, and all that stuff. Is that what you're asking? So, as a drug wire, what does it stuck in the new world, like in the blood? The different drugs are different. Right? So, for instance, like, the, like smoking, you know, may impact the fetus being smaller. And maybe premature birth, right? Just give an example. Some drugs may not have any impact, like one of the opioids, as we're saying, they don't have an impact on the organs, but the, but the newborn, if the woman was using, let's say, heroin, 
When he gets born, he goes into withdrawal because he's used to hell. You see, so different things are different in that way, right? There's no one thing, you know, across the board. Okay. Just to, because we are... Oh, we're not that? Time, but I mean, we have we're different not. people that ask a question. So oh. we have one, two, uh, three, four, five. <laughs> How much, How much time do we have? How much time do we have? We still have like three, four, five minutes. So if you ask the question and answer quickly, because I want to give time for Dr. Mad to, to conclude his uh, session. Oh, and so I have to go. I have a patient. I, I know. Yeah. So, so please, let, let me, me let me yeah. let's do this. Let me just quickly tell you about these things. So nicotine, we talked about. I just want to make sure you know that all these chemicals are in a cigarette, and nicotine is addictive, but that doesn't cause diseases. There's all the other stuff. 70 carcinogens when people smoke. Unbelievable, right? This is the lump of a smoker versus the healthy person, right? And yeah. I won't have time to get to that, into that, but this is so to show you that even one cigarette a day is still you pay half of the risk of smoking a whole pack a day. That's the brand of the dog. And, oh, I didn't get to talk about electronic cigarettes. Maybe we could do another session about that. Yeah, yeah, because we'll of course, we'll see you. Yeah, there's a lot. I think we need another session. There's a lot of information I want to tell you yeah. about electronic cigarettes. Yes. Yeah, but the one thing I want to tell you about electronic cigarettes is this product. This is the newest thing. It's called, uh, they're disposable puff bars, they call them. That's the newest danger because the companies okay. try to avoid or evade the FDA's ban on, on the flavor because okay. kids like flavors. So they came up with this concept of putting synthetic nicotine into their products. So then the FDA does not have a, a, you know, a legal authority over them. And they're in this sort of gray area, which is crazy, but that's just to be aware of it. And so, what else I want to tell you? Oh, do you see this? That was an eighth grader. They asked them to draw something to take home to tell their parents, the guy parents where they shouldn't smoke. <laughs> you see, it's your, if God wanted to smoke, you would have a chimney. <laughs> and look at the mouth, how all black, right? Yes, I love this one. It's, uh, all right, other substances that are important to know very common is marijuana, but also stimulants. Marijuana, they have stimulants, right? It's common it's among. In high school and in yeah. college, because they want to perform, they end up using them. So that's again, we'll have to talk about that another day. Okay, ecstasy, methamphetamine, I mean, you know, this, all kind of things. But the one that really we shouldn't forget about is caffeine. <coughs> caffeine actually, again, it's not alcohol. Oh, everybody drinks it, no problem. But if you do drink in excess, it can be a problem, right? So, Again, we won't have time to get into it, but I can tell you this is important to know that you can have all the way in a, in a like a Starbucks, not to pick on them, but any coffee shop, you can have a lot of caffeine in one thing. It's great compared to what you get from home, but also energy drinks. You see, like Red Bull is up there. They have a lot of caffeine. That's the, all that they have to stimulate people. And you know, there have been reports of kids dying, like this report, and again, we'll talk about another day. So be careful with energy drinks, caffeine, excess, it could kill somebody, not only does it drink no, well. So that's it. The questions before we wrap up? Um, yes. Somebody has? Or, yes. Or we don't have time anymore? Yeah. Should I close this? I'm going to close this. Go ahead, Mom. Uh, how do you tell the difference? Or like, and like a patient, like between like stress and like anxiety, oh, like yes, where's yes. where's like the line between like how do you? So 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 stress, as we said, it could be useful as long as it's not causing you know a problem, right? The minute that starts causing problem, like for instance, if it's too much stress, they cannot focus anymore because they're so tense. That's the problem. Then it becomes you know, uh, and it could be just momentary. It could be ongoing. So if it's an ongoing. That's anxiety, that's not okay, that's not useful anymore, you see, that's when I say the problem. Right. Okay, one more question, we go quick again. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, as, as the brain is developing, mm -hmm. what is the effect of ex exposing uh, people to things like maybe that they shouldn't watch? But exposing anything when you're still developing the brain makes it harder to quit later on because the brain develops around it, you see? Not only that, but also damages the brain, like what we're saying. For instance, e-cigarettes is another thing that kids were using because of flavors, they thought it's fun, there's no big deal. 
that has dignity, especially in your versions of them, then the brain that we were talking about earlier, you know, has those pathways open. So, so yeah, but it exposes you to use other drugs there, smoking cigarettes or other things. So that's what, you know, the problem is, yeah? Yeah, we go quickly. That's right. You forget your question. <laughs> 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 it must not be important, right? Just a quick comment. Um, uh, I was going to make a comment before you yeah. ask the question uh, about pregnancy. Guys. Pregnancy. And you, so, he, um, absolutely, I agree with that. Different drugs have different. For example, fetal alcohol syndrome is well known to cause um, fetal malformations, heart diseases, mm -hmm. mental heart diseases, cleft palate, and left palate. So, um, um, uh, marijuana in particular, a lot of pregnant women think that marijuana is okay, but we have to be thankful that we live in Texas and we don't have marijuana as a legal drug. 7% of pregnant women, when I ask them, do you do anything, they say no. And then when I ask specifically about marijuana, they say yes. So marijuana is well linked to um, developmental abnormalities uh, of the child later in life. Mm -hmm. Um, not necessarily congenital malformations, but a lot of memory issues, um, concentration issues, development. Mm -hmm. So be careful with that. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Maher, for your time. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you so much. Yeah. And course, this, one, this session is one of the sessions that we have the most participation and questions in it. Thank you for your patience and to take all these questions. And I feel, of course, we will be in need for more questions in the future. Okay, thank you so much. He has to go because he has more work. Uh, uh, guys, uh, high school.